Go ahead, Peter. Okay, great. Welcome, everyone. My name is Peter Davenport. I'm a research assistant professor in the Department of Computer Science and the Center for Biomedical Engineering at the University of New Mexico. Uh, today, we have talks from uh, Dr. Philippe Bastiens and Dr. Zachary Manza. We'll start with Dr. Bastiens, who has a 30-minute talk, uh, plus uh, 10 minutes, uh, yeah, plus, and there'll be 10 minutes for questions afterwards. Um, Dr. Bastians uh, is director of the Department of Systemic Cell Biology at the Max Planck Institute of Molecular Physiology and a professor at the Technische Universität Dortmund. Uh, he's, uh, he and his colleagues have developed special fluorescence microscopy techniques such as FLIM and FRET and use them to explore protein signaling pathways. He's currently focused on the interdependence of membrane dynamics and early growth factor signaling processes in cells. In this context, he investigates how the interaction of receptor tyrosine kinases, um, small GTPases and SARC family kinases with membrane systems affect the dynamics of signaling networks and thereby change the cell's perception of the environment. He has started a new synthetic biology research line reconstituting biochemical building blocks uh, from a trinity of signaling, uh, cytoskeletal dynamics, and membrane shape that interact with a closed loop causality to give rise to self organized morphogenetic systems, uh, morphogenic systems. Um, and so, yes, yeah, so that will be related to, the, to, to today's talk, um, uh, which is entitled A Synthetic Morphogenetic, uh, morphogenic Perceptory System. Uh, so, yes, when you're ready, Dr. Bastians, please start. All right, thank you very much for this introduction. So yes, I will uh, talk about this uh, synthetic morphogenic receptory cell. Um, it's a long-term endeavor that we have tried indeed to build from, uh, from scratch, try to make a lifelike system. Interestingly enough, we have just recently published uh, this work and it has a different title. So um, uh, am I sharing actually? I'm not sure. I should share, I oh, guess. Yeah. See anything. <laughs> there you go. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right. So I do it again. So synthetic morphogenic perceptory cell. So I, I, I changed the title because the word perceptory is what I think is fundamental uh, to understand um, living systems. So the way we have called it in this paper is actually synthetic morphogenic membrane system. But like I said, I think Perception is a subjective way that a living system can actually interpret the environment. And so I have to say something about that. Uh, let me just. So with that, I start with a kind of a prologue. And that is the idea or the relation between perception and subjectivity. So if you look in general, uh, how we perceive how biological systems like cells, living units, process information, it's basically like a computer does. It's like an input, a stimulus, can be a growth factor, can be a mechanosensing sensing input. And then there's a processing part that you see here on the right, typically giving like these blobograms where you see a flow of information and there you get um, like a unidirectional causality toward a response in the system. From my perception, that's very much like machine thinking, like living systems operate, uh, operate like machines. Um, I would like to give a little different twist on that, and that is the idea of recursive communication, where in a way the system represents a perception of its inner world, its inner state, as well as the outside world, in a dynamic state of the proteome. So it's about relationships between 
molecules and not so much about the things themselves. And that perception um, or that dynamic state is actually dependent on the history, so its own state, as well as on the state of and other entities it can recursively communicate with. Recursive communication means that it's bidirectional. So in this way, each entity can actually um, generate new dynamical solutions that the individual entities cannot generate. And this is where this important concept from my point of view of perception comes in, which is the ability to capture and process and actively interpret sensory information. And that is an important part here based on prior experiences to successfully interact with the environment. Now, what does successfully interacting with the environment mean it means that you stabilize your identity. And pretty much actually what one writes here also is true possibly for human brains, is how we interact in a recursive communication in ways where we can generate new dynamical solutions and new ideas. And that is why I like to perceive the team that I worked with as a collective computing device, a cognitive network of networks and I was first of all lucky that these were exceptional individuals um, that cared about what they were doing, had an enormous effort to, to bring something together, what was on many levels very difficult, but only that we also basically learned to speak the language of different disciplines and assimilated that to generate something that was more than the sum of its parts. So as you see here, I think uh, the endeavor I'm going to talk about is, is, is about three things that came together. Basically, experimental systems. This is biochemistry, knowing the profound way molecules operate, um, how to purify them, how they work together on a structural level, for example. Then theories is, is all about dynamics, in this case, very strongly nonlinear dynamics to describe collective behavior. And then comes in another important part. We can never observe a full system. It's impossible. Even if we look at our world around us, it's only very small parts that we can really observe and we don't just generate abstract representations of reality in a way. So observation has to deal with how you deal with data, how you can extract most data and how to interpret the data. It's all about photonics in a way in our case. And that was very much done by uh, Bruno Scorsese. So on the left side, you see two theoreticians, Aneta Kuzeska, who's an expert in nonlinear dynamics uh, with her student, Akhles Nadam, who developed the theories that I'm gonna present, and Malte Schmick, which is a longtime collaborator that developed uh, reaction diffusion simulations, very essential to understand the system I'm gonna present. So let's get to the system itself. So why, why did we actually engage this endeavor? This endeavor of generating biomimetic non-equilibrium lifelike matter. And the whole idea behind it was to understand principles of non-equilibrium phenomena in cellular information processing and morphogenesis. Now, the idea here is, of course, to bridge scales. It's how can nanometer-sized molecules actually generate or manifest uh, functionality in cells on a micrometer scale. So three orders of magnitude. If you talk about volume, you're talking about seven orders of magnitude. And the idea is to actually not look at specifics in a sense, but try to find fundamental principles where collective computing actually originates from the way the relationships between molecules generate certain systems. And these are universal. They not necessarily have to deal with molecules. They can also deal with higher order scale um, systems like social insects. Now, one of the fundamental researchers um, that, in my opinion, had an absolute breakthrough in thinking was uh, Pierre Paul Grasset, who studied social insect and the nest building, and came up with this, um, this concept of uh, stigmergy, which means so much as leaving a sign on work in progress. It's a basically a structure whose current state affects its future state. Now, if I simply describe how, how it works in a very uh, simplified way, is that the termites, in this case, the social insects, um, they do nothing else than shuffling the sand around. Uh, so they're basically the energy of the system. They just shuffle things around, except there's one special thing about this, is that they leave a sand on, on, on a sand grain that, that is being carried around. And the second thing is that that, that sand 
term on in this case actually increases the drop chances of a termite that randomly passes by. Now, if you leave out the, the termites for a moment, let's say we're, we're, not, we're blind to them for some reason, we cannot observe them because we're not looking the right spectrum or something like that. You will just observe the sand grain moving around, which becomes by itself a living system by actually in a way interacting with these termites. What you would observe basically is that the pile is a self-amplifying structure that depletes the free sand grain that moves around like crazy. The pile itself is immobile, right? We sort of have an autocatalytic loop in a way, or a self-amplified loop here that depletes the freedom. So it inhibits the freedom of the sand grain to move around versus the free sand grain actually contributes to the pile. So in a way you have a, an amplification here, uh, a feedback, a positive feedback together with a negative feedback that can actually generate this, um, is very nicely patterned pillars. And these are all dynamically maintained. And of course, the system is self-organizing, so you get a regularity. Self-organization generates in a dynamic system where there's energy input that generates regularity. Now, what is interesting about this is a self-organizing system doesn't have a template. It doesn't have a blueprint of how it's built. It's all about the local interactions that create a structure at a higher scale. But if you put a template inside that self-organizing system, like the queen itself, that actually signals her own growth by a pheromone gradient, the same pheromone that was used to leave the sign on these sand, sand pebbles, then what you get is a dynamic structure that actually is built around her and that adapts to her side. So what does that mean in a way is that you have a template, in a way it's an exocellium post, um, constraint on the system that constrains the dynamical solutions of the system and can generate their brand new structure. Okay, you would wonder why should I talk about this? Because what we have created is actually a morphogenic biochemical system that is based on real cellular components that operates under exactly the same principles as how social insect built their nest. And so what I will try to show you here is that we have a signaling system that is by itself stigmergic. So it does exactly the same as these termites do. So it has the same causality relationships as well as the cytoskeletal model do. Both are dynamic systems. So they require energy input to maintain certain states. But the important thing here is that we have this recursive communication I've talked about before between these two systems via A, a signaling gradient which is again itself a deceptive structure that can communicate to the cytoskeletal module and actually change the dynamic instability parameters that, for example, make microtubules grow. But that causes the memory deformations, which is actually the means by which these systems can communicate in the other direction that affects the signal module. So we have here our recursive communication between these two stigmatic systems. So let me start how to build such a system. Now here I'm gonna compare, let's say natural and synthetic signaling. Of course, everything is a simplification. So here again, perception. So on the left side is a simple signaling pathway. That is what you see many times, it gives you a linear causality. And this is the way that, for example, morphogens or growth factors are perceived by cells and bind to a growth factor receptor, as you can see over here. Now, uh, this activate typically a good ideal exchange factors. These are molecules that activate these very special molecules here, GTPases. Why are these special? Because these molecules actually interact with membranes and can change the concentration of other molecules like kinases by interacting them locally on the membrane. I'll come back to that in a second. Okay, so there's now an inactive state that by this GEF, you get an exchange and you exchange GDP for GTP, you get an active conformation that can now interact with the factors that are in the cytoplasm. All right, anyway, so this RAC activation in this language actually activates the kinase that then phosphorylates the microtubule regulator molecule. That's also an important central element here, okay? So it phosphorylates it and thereby inhibits it. And this itself is a inhibitor of microtubule growth. So it's a negative regulator of microtubule growth, twice negative means positive, so you get activation. Now let's look shortly at this perception here. This shows, it's a blobogram, obviously, but shows reaction conversions. 
Right, so again, we had these here our local growth factor that binds to these, to these receptors. We have these reversible activation, GAF to activate, GAP to inactivate. And now comes the important part. What is the basic principle that happens here? The basic principle is very simple. You have reaction cycles that change the balance upon translocation and thereby dimensionality reduction of a kinase, which actually changes its local concentrations by orders of magnitude. Now I'll explain how this exactly works and it can actually generate local gradients that can then interact with the microtubule cytoskeleton. Again, very linear still, it's very unidirectional causality, but this is a fundamental basis. Now, imagine you have to create such a system. You will work for decades. So the idea of saying, I'm gonna reconstruct something that is in a living system, with that complexity is in my opinion, almost impossible and maybe even futile. Uh, it's very hard to make all these molecules work together. Also, bringing them together at the right time um, is, is practically impossible. So I think what we should do instead is actually try this biomimetic approach. Can we actually capture all the essential elements, the essential element of dimensionality reduction, the essential element of reaction cycles that restructure the balance, and the essential element of having a localized mimic of a growth factor stimulus? And we can do this by using these optogenetic approaches that actually translocate now a statmine kinase here as a PBROB yeah, to the membrane by light. Again, very important that it stays localized. So we mimic localized responses of a morphogen. All right. And again, similarly, so you see we make a huge shortcut here, but it's all the same principle. And then we rebalance a cycle here. As you see that we share in both systems of a futile cycle actually creates now a local concentration of a very high activity that can generate these dissipative structure of a gradient, which by itself is a template in this case. Okay, let's have a look at this. So we had to engineer, do a protein engineering to, to actually build the system. So we had to use this uh, optogenetic approach, this ILI system, this loft-based um, uh, structure, and upon large changes conformation can then interact with this SSPB domain. So what we have done is very simple. We took this islet domain and actually fused it to the C2 domain that interacts with negatively charged phospholipids like phospholipidylserine that we can introduce in our vesicles. So that we associate, let's say, this part of the system to the membrane. Now we had to fuse our kinase, aurora kinase, to SSPB in order to make it light responsive in, in, in this case. Now that this work is very simple. This is shown over here. And instead of using a morphogen those response, you know, like a titration that you would put in your system, typically do that for cells, for example. So those response, we can actually dose the light to get a similar type of dose response. Well, this is not so exciting. What is exciting is this. If you now come with a localized light cue, okay, you have to imagine everything diffuses in the system, all right? So now we activate only this part of the system. Now what happens is there, only there where there is light, you get actually the activation of, of this eyelid system that can interact with SSPB so that the kinase is translocated, all right? However, of course, it diffuses also the membrane, but at the moment it's outside of the light area. Yeah, it goes back yeah, to, its, let's say, close conformation. It's then released SSPB. Of course, it has a certain relaxation time. And so the balance between diffusion and, and let's say relaxation from yeah, this relaxation kinetics, the release from the eyelid actually generates then a steady state gradient. Now what you have here, and you have to realize that as well, is actually a dynamic cycle because everything that comes off is actually diffused around and is pumped here. So we have a pump that maintains basically a localized steady state gradient. That's very important. So this thing in time is stable. Now here you can see a, a radio chymograph of the same thing. However, what was very interesting, so we can have a localized response that is really useful for what I'm going to show. But what was interesting here is that it was extremely localized. If we took another protein and we attached it actually to this SSPB system, the gradients are way more shallow. Okay, and what they showed actually is that this aurora kinase is actually self-associate and thereby slow down diffusion. Okay, now the other point that is important to see here is that you can switch it on and you can switch it back off. So it's, it's, it's reversible where you switch off the light. Okay, so far so good. So localized activity, but we had something very interesting. We have self-association. Okay, fine. Indeed, when we now looked at the surface of these vesicles, when we translocated, we saw indeed these clusters appearing. 
Okay, here you see in the world map representation that you see this kind of starry night. Here below, by the way, you can see a lipid, uh, unlocked fluorescent lipid, where you can see that these type of, of clusters are not due to lipid defects. Okay, so um, basically all these stars that you see here are, are clusters. So what we have basically, we have an energy driven system that actually maintains a concentration. Yeah? So out of equilibrium, that's the first thing. So this is a very clear example of an out of equilibrium situation in a cell that actually generates a different state. Okay, so fine, we have here reversible clustering. Um, but there was more going on. If you actually use the way of actually looking at regularity, and there's several tools, and I will not go into details for this talk, but you can use something that's called uh, recurrence quantification analysis, which looks at regularities by basically shifting the images relative to each other, and, and then basically looking at how regular the patterns are. And, and the entropy is actually a measure of regularity. Uh, that's one of the measures of regularity in the pattern. Now. When we looked at that, it was very interesting because if you related the amount of translocations, so in other words, the more we depleted, the more regularity we got. That's what you see over here. And it was independent of ATP. Okay, so that had nothing to do with kinase activity. Okay, the energy that was provided here to generate that regularity was the light energy. Okay, now the other thing is when we had this other protein, this uh, phosphatase that we attached that doesn't self-associate, we didn't see these regularities occur. Yeah? As you can see it very clearly also here on this uh, world map representation. Now, what does this really mean? If you have this regularity from a higher skill perspective of the system, we can automatically conclude here that we have a positive feedback. This is not something we investigated on a molecular level, but Emilia appears by the fact that we had this regularity. So it's very interesting. You get actually a higher end information about regularity that is not possible without this positive feedback here. So what do we have really? We have a situation, we have exactly the same as I explained with the termites, is where we have a self-amplifying pile that depletes the free grain, in this case, the free monomer, right? That moves very fast because it's alone, right? So when it is clustered, this diffuses very slow. Now we could consider this on the membrane alone. You can actually use the tree component system where you also consider this in the, in the cytosol, but it's not necessary because the eyelid is a limiting factor. So that determines the total mass. That's also very easy to actually model this with a paradigmatic reaction diffusion model, which is very generic for any system. And where you can see that dependent on certain bifurcation parameters in the system, like total concentration of aurora that you have seen, that you indeed get these very regular patterns now shown here for this Euclidean geometry. Okay, so we have a self-organizing system based on a self-amplifying structure, coalescence of matter that depletes its own building blocks. The same as with the termites. Okay, let's move on. So that's all fine, but this doesn't do anything to the cytoskeleton, right? So we have to do something else. We have to actually now couple that system now to something that affects the cytoskeleton. So we're still thinking in a linear way. So first thing, as I already explained, is this dimensionality reduction, which was actually, by the way, described decades ago by Delbruck as a fundamental feature of how you can actually activate systems in, in, in living systems. Uh, very nice book, uh, book actually that was published. It was the first publication of it. Anyway, we do this with light instead of morphogens. But now the idea is that we somehow affect, of course, this, this, this microtubule regulator. Okay, so what is this microtubule regulator? It's actually a very simple molecule. What it does, it does nothing else than sequestering free tubulin dimers, the building blocks of our micro, uh, microtubules, okay? So what it does, in a way, it, it, it is like a buffer. It, like it, 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 it sequesters the building blocks of the microtubules and thereby affects their growth. Very simple, okay? Now, of course, you have a, you know, an interaction here that has a certain affinity and you can also have this state. However, when this molecule gets phosphorylated, it can basically not bind to the tubulin anymore. Okay, that means that upon phosphorylation, you get a release of your tubulin. Okay, that would be very simple. So we have a fantastic system. We have our kinase. If somehow we get concentrated, then we would just phosphorylate the thing and everything would be fine. So we have our system ready. And there's no way because, of course, what we do here in this case, A, if it would work that way, we would only get one shot, right? Because we we'll go from this state to this state and that was it. You can never change the system back to anything else. It cannot respond to anything that is upcoming in the future. 
right? Also, it's just a global regulation, right? To just increase the concentration of tube linen. And like any self-respecting biochemist knows, any kinase has basal activity. So if you wait long enough, the whole system will be in one state, right? So this thing cannot do very much. So what you need to do is actually generate futile cycles. So you need to consume energy to make the system in a way responsive. Uh, so this already brings it into non-equilibrium. So you're consuming ATP for nothing in a certain sense. Right, so now we have a futile cycle that constantly you get phosphorylation and then you get dephosphorylation and we go all the time back and forth. However, if you translocate the kinase now by light or by growth factor, or same thing, locally you have an order of magnitude increase in the local concentration. There's nothing else in the concentration device in a way, right? That now makes this branch much larger than this branch. The phosphatase doesn't move, it's still there. So locally at the membrane, the kinase wins from the phosphatase and now we get mostly locally the phosphatase that actually diffuses out. Okay, so it's just now phosphorylated by the kinase, I'm sorry, uh, diffuses out and the phosphate will dephosphorylate it and bring it back. Okay, simple principle. So it's just this. And we also have reversibility, right? So in the, in the lumen, it's like this, close to the membrane, it's like this. So that should generate a local concentration. Remember, this is diffusible, it's not attached to anything. Okay, dissipative structure, right? A local gradient that consumes energy uh, that would affect locally microtubules. Okay, let's have a look if that's really the case. So now if you look here, we can actually measure that by making an optical sensor for statmen that changes actually its conformation when it is bound to tubulin. It becomes like an elongate. So in, in, let's say without tubulin, when it is in the free form, it's in a spaghetti state, it kind of flops around. Yeah, and when it is uh, this extended helical conformation when it passes to uh, tubulin dimers. Now it's very nice because here you can see that we can uh, use a ratiometric uh, measurement of threat in this case, it's a two chromophores, it's a proximity measurement. You can see that if you put the, the system inside uh, GUVs, in the absence of phosphatase, okay, everything is there, the kind is everything, and we translocate, everything is in the same state. And you see everything is in a phosphorylated state, very clearly here, okay, it's a flat map. However, if you put the phosphatase in there, of course, after translocation of the kinase, you can clearly see that we get this highly active phosphatase, or sorry, um, a statmin, phosphorylated statmin, very locally here in this rim. Now that's about a very short decay, now, which is actually determined by the concentration of the phosphatase. So the decay length of such gradients is determined by the phosphatase concentration and actually diffusion. But the phosphatase concentration is very important there. All right, this is in the absence of the phosphatase, completely flat. All right, so we have a dynamic cycle here that we can switch on, that's reversible, that does allow us to actually generate a signaling gradient. However, statmin itself doesn't do anything with microtubules. And it's the only thing it does, it releases tubulin. So how does it supposed to function? Because it just releases tubulin here, tubulin will just diffuse out and then it's equilibrating everywhere again. So we have no local effect whatsoever. So that is where we try to, to do simulations actually with the five species, which is basically the phosphorylated statmin and the statmin with and without tubulin binding and a free tubulin, okay? So this is defies any form of analytical solution. So we had to resort to numerical simulations using cell automata, which is a very efficient way of using kernel operations to do these co uh, computations. Anyway, so what you see, we can actually very nicely independent of phosphatase concentration, reproduce our our fossil statement gradients that we find experimentally and actually corresponds very well with the actually actual activity that we have encapsulated with the decay length that we find. But what's way more interesting, and that's why I like simulations sometimes because they educate your intuition, is that we also find, found that actually you get a corresponding gradient of free tubulin. And there's where we actually started to really think, how does the system work? So what the system really is, this cycle, is not a phosphorylation um, gradient of statmin that causes the signaling, it's a molecular tubulin pump. So let's go from here. So you see a statmin with a two tubulin dimers yeah, that diffuses free around and then it hits the membrane. Okay, at that moment it gets phosphorylated, it releases the tubulin that starts diffusing out, but also the statmin, the phosphorylated statmin that cannot bind to tubulin. Immediately when it diffuses out, the phosphatase will, uh, dwells in the cytoplasm, uh, it will diffuse a bit out and then the phosphatase will dephosphorylate it. Now it can recapture tubulin. Okay, so bring it back. Now we have an ATP driven tubulin pump because this now generates a directional flux of tubulin in this direction that counters diffusion of tubulin in the other direction. So we have a soluble tubulin concentration gradient here. Now, if you increase tubulin concentration somewhere, you can 
when a microtubule comes in that area, increases growth or stabilizes growth. Okay, deep breath. Let's look at the second module. Yes, so let me look at my time. How am I with my time? Oh yes, we have about uh, four minutes left. What? Oh my God. Okay. All right, so, okay, I think I have to jump a lot. So let me just skip this. I will just say the following, that this system has its own exactly the same. So microtubules, dynamic microtubules, constantly grow and shrink, can deform the membrane. And when I deform the membrane, that can capture all the microtubules. It's called self-induced capture, okay? So we have exactly the same system I've shown before, which you can model, for example, by reaction diffusion simulations as shown over here. So again, it generates a self-organized system exactly the same as I showed for the termites. So what we have here is two interacting systems. Now, I'm going to skip all this. It's unfortunate, but it's the way it is. So what we have is two stigmergic systems here, the aurora, that self-organized into these patterns on the membrane. Here we have the microtubule system that can generate these patterns that have these recursive communications on both ends. Okay, now dependence on, on if self-induced capture dominates, so this part here dominates over cooperative clustering or the signaling, then we have a polar solution shown like this, initial solution. This guy is not responsive to stimuli, it's very robust. Versus in the case where signaling dominates over this part, then we get a star solution, as very nicely shown over here, and this system actually can respond. So let me go on. So very quickly again here, so we have two stigmergic interacting systems, a recursive communication as I explained in the beginning, right? Where now in the case where we induce a template, this is now in silico, right? So we induce a template where now self-induced capture dominates, let's say over cooperative clustering in signaling, that that system is robust to changes. However, in the other way around, where cooperative clustering, this part dominates over this part, we get a star solution. And now when you come at a local activation, you amplify this part against all the others. And so it's the most plastic situation. Uh, and the system changes from star to polar. However, it's robust, it cannot go back. Now, this is exactly the same as I've shown for the situation with a template on this um, social behavior of insects is where this template constrains the self-organized dynamical solutions of the system. In a way, you choose one of the solutions out of the system. Now, let's look at the in vivo cinema mess. Yeah, so this is the system, we have it completely reconstructed and the response to local Q. So here we start with a, with a, with a star solution. Okay, so it's, it's all these spikes that you see on the, on the side and we're gonna now activate in the Northeast. And the system is gonna completely reorient towards this side and actually go towards the polar solution. Now it's extremely fascinating to look at it because you can even see the microtubule dynamics poking as you look very carefully, it will not go uh, into that situation over here. So this is a situation where cooperative clustering dominates over sick, this branch. Now let's turn this around. Now we have a situation here where we have strong self-induced capture, so several microtubules in this thing, it is polar solution. And now we're gonna actually tickle this thing on the sides, right? So. First, on the left side, you will see it's actually it's highly dynamic. It will actually try to move in its size because it pushes more on this side and it will even go back. But you will see that it actually will actually swallow all these microtubules into this ma major protrusion and actually maintain that polar organization. Okay, so we can actually move it around. That's clear. So it responds to that. But in a way, it's, it's locked into this, into this state. So what have you learned from this? So we have here self-organized morphological information processing where you cannot talk anymore about the unidirectional um, information flow as we typically tend to think about when we, when we deal with cellular, uh, cellular systems. Um, so the recursive interaction between these astromicrotubules and signaling are mediated by the deformable membrane. This is this indirect communication I was talking about that's, that Pierre Paul Grasset was actually uh, describing already in 59. This is important for me at least. Um, so cellular perception of morphogen signals and subsequent self-organized morphological manifestation is dependent on prior shape and therefore on stimuli history. So we cannot anymore disentangle shape from signaling. It is one information processing system that actually its response depends on what it has experienced before. 
And this also means that this must be true for cells because exactly the systems operate and you can also deform the membrane. So for, for real cells. Now, there's one more interesting thing and that this system, because it has this recursion here, has the emergent property of mechanosensing, mechano right? So since deformation affects the signaling, now also means when you apply a deformation that the system will activate the signaling. So it's not only responsive to light. So we have a new immersion property as well, which allows us now to go one step further and do that. What I actually discussed in the beginning is that we can now actually study self-organized tissue formation by recursive communication between the sims, where one of, of these you know, closed loop systems here by deforming the membrane can affect the other and vice versa. So we have clearly also recursive communication, not intrinsically, but also extrinsically, which will generate self-organized tissues. These are our first attempts, by the way, in that direction. Anyway, I'm sorry. I'm always very bad at these things in terms of timing. I thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to talk about this. And I really hope that we see each other live instead of in this way, where we can start our recursive communications to do some collective computing. Many thanks. Thank you, Dr. Bastian. That was a yeah, generally fascinating talk. Um, let's see what we have in the way of questions. Um, I'm not seeing it. Well, I'll, I'll kick one off. Uh, so I was wondering if you could talk about this, the timescales uh, upon which these operate, these systems operate, and, whether, and is that a sort of how long can these function for as well? Is that a constraint in terms of the complexity of, this, of the sort of uh, behaviors that you can, you can uh, induce? Um, yeah, yeah, I understand your question. So, so first of all, the question I have is, first of all, the lifetime of the system itself is constrained by the stability of the proteins, which is a major issue. And of course, it's just still a battery. So we introduce chemical potential in the system, right? Mm. And so we need to make systems like photosynthetic systems that we can couple to, for example, ATP or GTP generating systems that allow us to use light externally to actually fuel the system, right? But uh, more precisely in terms of the, of the question you had in terms of time scale. So if you look at translocation and generating a steady state gradient is in the order of a minute, okay? Right. Uh, if you look at uh, conversions in terms of, uh, of morphologies, we're talking about uh, something like 10 minutes, between five and 10 minutes. Okay, that makes sense. And uh, so yeah, I, might, I was looking at questions. About how, what was the total, like, so the stability of the proteins, what was the total, what's, what was the half-life of your least stable protein, or roughly, what's the order of that? Um, yeah, the most difficult protein in this system was Aurora. I mean, one of the difficulties we're working with is a system that you have to put them together in a way that has an environment where they all, let's say, I don't like to work, but they feel good, let's say, they don't denature so on. Uh, that is the really hard part, you know, in a cellular system where you have all this uh, bricolage going on uh, in a way, systems adapt to each other, there are all kinds of saprons, you name it. Uh, that was really the hardest part. So the, the weakest part in that sense was the Aurora kinase. Uh, it's rather unstable. So we could get it, uh, you know, functioning and then you get aggregation in about an hour or so. Right. Uh, it depends also a little bit on the operator. Light is toxic, by the way, for any molecule because it generates radicals. You also have to be very careful with the light uses. Right. Yeah. Okay. That's, that's interesting. I wonder if there's, um, well, yeah, I could I've got a few questions I could add to that afterwards. Um, so, yes, we have a question from, from Jacqueline Delora. Um, how would the mechanical properties of the surrounding media impact the strength of the extensions or stars? If you embedded the GVs into a soft or stiff matrix, would you see the deformations? <laughs> I still see the de would you still see the deformations? Yeah, so yeah. Very good question because, okay, so I mean, I could not show it. I mean, I'll take that opportunity. Ha -ha. That's how you do it, right? So you try to cramp information. Um, okay, so let me show you something here. Okay, so what we did, for example, is we controlled the rigidity or the or the, uh, you will see it here, okay? So this is a rigid membrane by osmolarity, okay? Now in this case, we cannot um, generate protrusions. That is also how we could actually see that the system works, okay? This is the full system. What you get then is actually the, the, the whole aster moves to the side because the system tries to minimize elastic energy, right? So try to find the longest path. So it's two R basically instead of R, right? So you have this nice spider moving to the side. Here you have a deformable membrane. Yeah, you can see it. It, 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 it can deform the membrane and actually generate a, 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 a new shape. So the answer to that is very difficult to 
to, to answer. Now, what we do see, however, when we put the SIMs together is that they can protrude in any sort of, um, let's say, membranes. Right, so that is how they can deform. And you get negative curvature, and that is where you affect um, the, what do you call it, the signaling in the other system. So long, long answer. It's a very important parameter. I don't know exactly how to control it. So we have not measured forces here at this stage, but that is a very interesting question. Okay. Uh, so we have a question from Felipe Quiroz. Uh, amazing work. Have you played with the self-association propensity of the kinase to control cluster size and membrane dwelling time? Yeah, this is a beautiful question. I'll tell you why. Uh, in my opinion, every molecule or every protein, I'm sorry, I should be precise here. Every protein, you know, interacts with itself dependent on concentration. It's what one always has to realize. Yeah, the cell is a soup and we always think about specificity. And it's, 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 it's not that clear, actually. And, and what you do by, by this dimensionality reduction is that you, you massively increase the concentration. And so things start to self-associate. And I think in a way, it's a form of phase separation that you generate that is self-organized in that sense, right? So this is really, really interesting. So you can indeed, what you could do is you could add specific domains, for example, that increase the propensity of self-association to play with the cluster size. And that could generate, for example, um, less of a, I would call it discrete um, response. Okay, but in my opinion, that could also be very important. If you look at nanoscale organization of many molecules, you always see that that plays a role in how system responds. So super interesting question and definitely something to explore. Great, I think we have time for maybe one more question. Uh, so Susan Atlas asks, is there an issue of trash collection in this system? where auxiliary molecular products need to be continuously removed to avoid unwanted side reactions that could interfere with function? Beautiful question again. Now, the first thing, of course, that we need to do is to make the energy cycles run continuously. That's why we need an energy conversion from light to chemical potential. That was, I talked about that in the beginning, okay? So you can use photosynthetic systems for that. It has been described to, uh, to do that, actually. So that would be very nice. Now, if there is metabolic byproducts that accumulate? This is a very interesting question, actually. Um, at this stage, no, I don't think we have that problem. Uh, the one problem that we have, of course, is denatured protein, right? As I discussed with Aurora. Um, and that can generate large clusters that can quite uh, distort the system. Okay, I think, um... I think we'll we'll have to move on to the uh, on to the next talk. Uh, but thank you yeah. very much. That was that was yeah. Thank you very much for for, for, for the presentation. That was that was that was incredible. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, it was so long. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Uh, so uh, yes, our next speaker today is Dr. Zachary Manza from Cornell University. He'll be talking about creating biomimetic interfaces using cell using the cell free synthesis of transmembrane proteins. Um, so yes, it's a 15 minute uh, talk plus five minutes of questions. So when you're ready, uh, Dr. Manza, please start. Sure, can you see my screen okay? Yes, we can. Okay, great. Yeah, thank you for the introduction. Um, and thanks to the organizers for inviting me to this. It's really been an enjoyable seminar series each week. Uh, there's been a lot, of, a lot of interesting talks, so I'm happy to contribute mine. Um, so as Peter said, uh, today I'll be talking about uh, sort of a new project in our lab that we've uh, just been working on recently with uh, in collaboration with the Kamat Lab at Northwestern University. And basically what we're doing is using cell-free synthesis of transmembrane proteins in order to create new biomedic interfaces that we can use for synthetic cell applications in biotechnology. Uh, so before I get started, I just wanna orient you sort of where we are. Uh, we're at Cornell University. It's this uh, um, school in upstate New York in uh, Ithaca, New York. And it's a really beautiful place. I'd really encourage you to uh, come visit if you ever get a chance once uh, things are a little more normalized. Um, but yeah, so when thinking about the important components uh, in, in cells, one of, the, one of the most important features is the interface um, of the membrane. Uh, in bacterial cells, the outer membrane. In eukaryotic cells, obviously, there's the plasma membrane is those organelles. And these membranes are a really critical interface in maintaining interactions and maintaining cellular viability. Um, they have immense complexity. Um, you can see the little schematic I have here. Um, they have glycans that are added on either to the lipids or the membrane proteins which modulate functions and transmit signals. The lipids themselves have the hydrophobic uh, interiors and the tails and the hydrophobic or hydrophilic exteriors and the head groups. 
And a class of uh, molecules that really interested is membrane proteins, which can be lipid length, they can be transmembrane, they can be uh, peripheral or membrane associated proteins. And these all work together to carry out really complex functions. And I've listed a few of them here. Um, they can carry out enzymatic conversions in the cell. They can serve as receptors to transmit information across the cell membrane, as well as serving as a transport uh, species across um, the membrane, such as with ions or other electrolytes. And so because these are so important, uh, scientists and engineers have really been working how do we can create synthetic versions of these. And you can think that if we can capture these uh, things that transmit uh, species through, they can be used for separations or maybe for biosensor applications. Uh, enzymes that carry out reactions can be used to create defined planar chemistry. An example I've shown here is with, with uh, glycosylation, which is an immensely diverse and complex reaction that takes place inside cells. And finally, anything that transmits information can be used to sort of screen therapeutics. And this might be a way to sort of for screen membrane proteins involved in pathogen detection or looking for um, drug discovery applications. Uh, these are just a few examples of ways we can sort of use and study membrane proteins in biotechnology or building up synthetic cells. And they all really rely on the proper incorporation of membrane proteins into a lipid environment. And they'll, they'll require tunability to maintain proper performance in any system you want to design. Uh, one of the bottlenecks in really achieving this is that our current analytical tools are sort of limited in their capacity. Um, one of the first major ways people study these is in cell-based assays, in which you basically take a live cell, image things that are going on inside it, and this can be very powerful. Um, but unfortunately, you're limited to sort of the complexity that you're getting just inherently in the membrane, as well as the constraints of being able to engineer and genetically modify these organisms um, to see the response that you want to see. The other side of the coin is a lot of people are familiar with here is uh, in model membranes. Um, these can be a variety of different approaches. Um, detergent uh, mediated micelles, um, nanodisks, which are lipid membranes belted by proteins or small molecules or polymers, um, as well as liposomes, which are spherical bilayer structures. Um, these all pose um, certain advantages in studying membrane proteins, um, but unfortunately, a lot of them have uh, difficulties in purifying proteins if you're doing a reconstitution approach. Um, if you're doing a cell free approach, um, a lot of them have issues with stability. And also nano disks potentially don't have a defined orientation. So if you're trying to do a flux-based assay, you aren't able to sort of get differentiation between both sides of the membrane. Um, and liposomes, you're unable to access the interior. So um, you're sort of limited based on what you can do with the exterior of the membrane. Um, that's not to say that these aren't really powerful tools in genetic cells, um, but this really motivate us into sort of how we can sort of extend this into something that's more robust and more stable um, to further the applications. Um, and one way that we do this in our lab is using a support liquid bilayer system. Um, what this is is sort of just like it sounds like it's a supported membrane um, on a planar surface. And this provides a lot greater stability. And because of the geometry, you, it's much more compatible with surface techniques um, to do spectroscopic studies, optical studies, electrical studies, um, et cetera. Um, these have really gone uh, through revolutions since they were first introduced in the 80s. Um, up to the point where we can now take fully native membrane materials and incorporate them into these bilayers. Um, one of the issues with these is that you still have the complexity. And so if you want to get uh, isolated effects, what you currently need to do is reconstitute proteins in these bilayers, which unfortunately has the downsides that I mentioned previously. And so what we want to do ultimately is be able to put a defined interface in these planar supports that gives us all of the ability to sort of use these planar bilayers um, with their greater stability and access to analytical tools but have a defined interface without the complexity needed so we can build up these synthetic platforms from the bottom up. And so this led us to the question of whether we can directly incorporate membrane proteins into support liquid bilayers. And this uh, led to a publication that we recently got out um, in ACS Applied Biomaterials. I'd highly encourage you all to check it out um, if you haven't already. And what we do here is we form a hybrid support liquid bilayer uh, made of lipid and dibloc copolymers and use cell-free synthesis, which I know a lot of us are familiar with, but very briefly, you can isolate the machinery for protein synthesis outside of a cell, um, either in a purified format or in a cell lysate format. Um, add in a piece of uh, DNA of interest, and then you can directly incorporate it on demand into, a, uh, into your membrane environment. In this case, we're using the model membrane protein, the large mechanosensitive channel of uh, conductance from E. coli. Um, this is a 10 pass transmembrane channel, and we include GFP as a reporter of membrane folding, uh, excuse me, uh, pro pro protein folding, as well as the ability to image these proteins after expression. And we envision that the ability to create these mimetic membranes um, with functional oriented membrane proteins will provide us a way to have a platform to carry out sensitive and precise uh, protein events. 
Um, so as I mentioned, we're using a blended membrane system, and this comes from the basis from the Kamat Lab at, at Northwestern University. They published in 2019, in which they can form blended membranes um, using a dye block called polymer. In this case, it's polyethylene oxide and uh, with the OPC lipids. And they found that by blending these dye block called polymers and lipids, they can tune the biophysical properties of the vesicles and affect the protein synthesis and uh, properties. So the first thing we did was take a little look at the vesicles themselves and make sure that the dye block copolymers and, and the lipids um, were interacting like we'd expect them to. And using dynamic light scattering, what we see is that as we increase our mole percent copolymer, we're largely keeping the same diameter um, and we're largely keeping the same data potential. And this indicates to us that any changes in the membrane properties and supported bilayers will be from the actual ratio of the, of the membrane components and not just from the dye block copolymer themselves. And so now that we have these vesicles, what we want to do is form them as a portal with bilayers. And the first thing we want to study is the 2D lipid fluidity. Um, the ability for lipids to move around is an important biological property that cells can maintain. And we want to see if we can maintain it in our system here. And the way we study this is that we can incorporate um, fluorescent lipids into this membrane. And we bleach a small spot with a laser. If the lipids can move, the bleached ones will be able to diffuse away, and the unbleached ones will diffuse back in. And what you see is a recovery over time if the lipids are mobile. We see the same behavior um, in 100% GPC and in the 15% copolymer. As we go to 50% copolymer, what you see is that the bleach spot does not recover, indicating these lipids cannot move. We can track these over time. In the left graph, we just have the uh, normalized intensity as a function of time. You can see that the behavior is largely the same as we increase in percent copolymer. But when you actually calculate the diffusivity, what we're seeing is that we're getting a steady decrease in diffusivity up until 50%, which we no longer see mobility. This might mean that the, as you increase percent copolymer, the polymer is actually preventing lipids from moving. But because we do maintain a very high mobile fraction of lipids, what we believe is happening is that the membrane viscosity is actually increasing to a point where the lipids are just becoming too viscous to move through each other. Um, the, the other alternative is that the member or the vesicles might not be rupturing. And so we wanted to take a secondary approach and study this using um, coarse spherical microrounds with dissipation. Um, in the interest of time, I won't go um, in depth with the actual details here. But basically what it is is that you have a silica-coated tensor you can deposit materials on, in this case, vesicles, and you can read out changes in the frequency and energy dissipation from the surface, um, which gives you indications of um, essentially mass and the, and the rigidity of your surface. So what we care about is the final change in frequency and dissipation. And what we find is that as we increase um, percent copolymer, we're seeing a pretty standard increase in the frequency, which corresponds to the increased mass of the polymer, and a very large jump at 100%, which indicates to us that these are unruptured vesicles because they contain buffer associated with the membrane. We see this um, in the energy dissipation as well. We see standard increases in the energy dissipation up to 50% copolymer. This is because we believe the polymer is giving us more flexibility in the film and a very large increase at 100%, which indicates unruptured vesicles to us. So we believe that up to 50%, we are rupturing vesicles into supported membrane, um, but at 50%, they're no longer mobile on the surface. So being able to tune this memory viscosity is a nice feature of this system because many times you want lipids to be mobile, but sometimes you might want to restrict diffusion without having to add additional biological components. So it gives us another synthetic tool to sort of control what's happening to the membrane. So obviously now that we can form bilayers, the next thing we want to be able to do is put proteins into them to carry out our functional assays. And we do this using two different approaches to give us more flexibility. The first is that we express the protein into a vesicle, um, we then rupture them on the surface. And the second, we form the bilayer first and then express the protein directly into it. And both of these should give us the same result. The first thing we check using these methods is whether or not the protein can affect the lipid mobility. And what we find largely is that there's not a huge difference between with and without protein. And we see this both in the diffusivity and in the mobile fraction of lipids. So it indicates that the protein is able to incorporate um, and not have a deleterious effect on the membrane itself. An important thing I want to check is whether or not these proteins are oriented. Um, they can be synthesized either inside out or right side up. And we want to see if that once they rupture, whether the protein is facing up or facing down. Um, this is important uh, when you want to do functional readouts is that your proteins should be oriented um, so you know what side of the membrane is facing up and you know uh, if you're getting the right flex of your components. If the protein is facing up, we have a TEB cleavage site attached to it, and we can use the protease to cut this off. If the protein facing down, the protein should not be able to access, access it, indicating that the, the signal should remain. And so what you see in the bottom left there, um, we express our protein and we see an increase in the fluorescent signal. After we add the protease, we see a decrease. This indicates to us that the, pro the protein is actually oriented upwards 
And by quantifying this, you can see that we get 90, about 90% reduction in protein. So they're all oriented uh, very uniformly. Uh, we then repeated this with our second approach. We formed our bilayers first and then expressed the protein directly into the membrane. And again, you see that before and after the protease addition, we see a large reduction in the GFP signal, um, indicating that we do have oriented proteins in the system. Uh, in this case, we're actually seeing an even larger reduction, which we believe is because we're not actually rupturing protein vesicles. And so there's nothing that can get stuck into the membrane. So the surface is actually much cleaner. Now, the orientation is very important for functional readouts. An important biological property that I haven't mentioned yet is actually protein mobility. Uh, the proteins need to be able to orient themselves in the membrane and associate with their neighbors. And so we want to see if we can maintain that mobility in our platform. And what we found is that you actually need at least 25% copolymer for mobility. And the copolymer is essential for this. And we believe it's providing a cushioning effect uh, from the substrate. And so what we did is record these images. And I'll highlight one protein here uh, just to make it easier to see. And what you can see is that as this protein is able to diffuse around, interact with its neighbors. So we can take all these videos and analyze the motion of each of these particles. I'm using single molecule tracking. And what we find is that if you can look at some example trajectories here, we get diffusivities around 0.16 microns squared per second, and we maintain about 50% mobility of our protein. We see similar results on approach number two and that our diffusivity is largely the same across each sample, and the mobile fraction remains about the same as well. So we then wanted to extend this approach. Now that we know the lipids are mobile, the proteins are mobile, and they're oriented, we wanted to show to so, uh, showcase some of the biophysical characteristics you can get using this approach. And what we did is a subunit photobleaching experiment to identify the oligomerization of the MSGL. Recall that this is a 10-pass uh, channel, and so this will actually be a pentamer, and there should be 5 GFP per molecule if it's properly associated. And what you can do is, um, in this example here, track the fluorescence of a single particle. And what you see is it bleaches over time. You see single steps of where each GFP bleaches out. You can then uh, calculate this um, over all the proteins you're imaging. And what we see is a distribution that corresponds uh, to what we'd expect to see for a pentamer. And again, these proteins are fully assembled. So now the work that we're uh, extending this into and that we're really excited about is whether or not we can sort of now couple these membranes um, with uh, active readouts. And so what we're doing is coupling this as a bioelectronic platform. And here, what we're doing is using a P.PSS film um, with supported bilayer on top of it. And this lets us do electrical impedance spectroscopy measurements um, and other electrical readouts um, in order to characterize these, these uh, transient proteins, whether or not they're functional or not. And so we perform the same uh, protocol. We use direct stuff reinsertion um, of the MSCL channel into the membrane. And we want to see if we can actually read out um, drug activation to see if they're functional. Here, I just show the structure of the MSCL um, to orient to what's going on. This is a mechanosensitive channel, and typically it's closed. Um, you can have a chemically activated mutant, um, G22C, in which case you get a, this molecule NP set, which should open the channel and allow memory or ions to pass through. And so, uh, in the interest of time, I'll just show the data here. What you're looking at is a uh, Nyquist plot showing the changes in impedance. Uh, the important characteristic to get out of this is that the radius of this hemicircle corresponds to memory resistance. And so as you get a larger hemicircle and a large radius, you're seeing a larger uh, resistance of, the, of ion flow through the membrane. And so we start with a base polymer here. We then add the bilayer, which then blocks the flow of ions into the surface. You see an increase in resistance. We then add protein expression. And for the wild type MSCL, when we add the drug, we see a very slight increase. Um, we believe this is because the empty set is positively charged. And so there can be some slight interactions there that can block ion flow. But importantly, when you express the G22C, what we see is a decrease in resistance, which indicates to us that the empty set is actually opening up the channel and allowing ions to pass through, indicating that these proteins are inserted functionally into the membrane. So uh, in conclusion, we are able to take di diblock copolymer hybrid liposomes and form some particle bilayers with tunable biophysical properties from them. We can then use cell-free expression to quickly incorporate membrane proteins into these bilayers. And importantly, the copolymer is essential for mobility. And these expressed proteins are oriented, mobile, and functional, as we were able to see with our activity readouts. And we really think this approach um, can lead to uh, the ability to address a lot of different challenges in synthetic biology and, and building up synthetic cells, um, such as in transport phenomena, member protein biosensors, enzymatic conversions, and uh, reading out complex binding events. Um, so that, I'd like to thank um, my advisor, Susan Daniel, um, my co-author on this project, um, Sergey Ghosh. Um, as well as our collaborators, Northwestern, uh, Neha Kamat and Miranda Jacobs.
And with that, I'd like to take any questions. Thank you, Dr. Anza. Yeah, great talk. I'll uh, have a couple of seconds for questions to arrive. Um, yeah. I suppose I might open the questions then with. Um, so I was just curious to see, so if this is a, I mean, I'm not particularly familiar with familiar with the sort of uh, with the supported supported bilayer systems in, in general so i was wondering um are there what are the constraints on the size of the protein that you can get on the support service and i'm particularly thinking about um i said proteins with large um domains that, that, that might protrude uh, in both directions and obviously that's part that obviously plays into the directionality of the insertion but i was wondering if you could just maybe expand them on the constraints there yeah sure no great question i'll, I'll skip back to this slide here um, it kind of shows um, what happens. So there's that, so in a normal supportive bilayer, you have about a one nanometer uh, water gap there, which is obviously very small. And so what we see happening is that we think the, co the copolymer is actually giving sort of a cushion to lift it off the membrane. And that's why we, we get mobility with the copolymer and not without. Um, the size will basically be, I think it will be kind of protein dependent. Obviously, if a large cytoplasmic region, you can have a lot of interactions with the glass support. And so I think it'll really depend on each protein, how much it interacts with the support. Um, you can have a larger cushioning system to sort of give you even more lift off the surface because it's largely a physical interaction that's putting the motion and not sort of just um, a biological interaction. Um, there are other supported systems using more tethered approaches that you, that give you larger distances. So you can incorporate larger proteins as well. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, so we have a question from Ashwarya Junija. Uh, is there a scope of lateral diffusion or flipping of molecules in the, in the, in the designed uh, uh, membrane? Think it might be to do with transmembrane, uh, like uh, membrane translocation. Is that correct? Sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I we haven't we haven't actually thought about whether or not the, the proteins can flip over. We know we've seen that they're all oriented in this sort of same direction, and that likely comes from the way the proteins are synthesized. Um, whether or not you can flip a protein over, my guess is that you would not be able to flip protein over the system. There are ways that you can inverse the vesicles themselves if you want to build it sort of um, in an inverse platform. Um, but if I'm understanding the question right, I don't think we'd be able to sort of get a protein to flip over when it's already formed in the bilayer. Okay, good. Um, so uh, Felipe Curos asks, are the ribosomes somehow direct, directed to interact with the membranes to favor insertion of the transmembrane, uh, to favor insertion of the transmembrane domains? Yeah, that's actually a great question. It's one I've thought about a lot. Um, in this system, we're actually using the pure system. So there's not um, chaperones and cofactors or chaperones and translocons available in the system. So in our system, it is just the ribosomes being directed to the membrane. Um, whether I, the ribosomes, I think it's a couple of interactions between the nascent peptide coming out, wanting to go into a hydrophobic region. Um, so I believe that is the thermodynamics are driving interaction there. Um, but there are other, other people have looked at ways you can use start incorporating chaperones and translocons in order to get directed insertion of these proteins into membranes. Um, but yeah, that's actually a really interesting question. Um, okay, Alan Kay asks, uh, extension of the question I was also asking was, um, how large can you make the gap with the copolymer? What are the limits there? Yeah, so that, that will come down to um, basically the size. Um, just to show like some basic theory here. Um, this comes from polymer cushioning from uh, Dijen. And this basically corresponds to the, uh, the brush regime of what the polymer length is. And so you, you can imagine that um, as you increase the peg chain, you're getting a larger and larger cushion. Um, you're obviously trading off some benefit, or um, you're just a trade off between the protein mobility and lipid mobility as you get to these large peg molecules. Uh, we've done in other systems up to peg 5,000. So you can get up, upwards of five to 10 nanometer cushions there. In this case, the peg group is only actually 600 Dalton. And so it's only at roughly one to two extra nanometers. And so you have, to do, you have to play around with how much you can incorporate in there. Um, like I mentioned, there are some other more advanced techniques. You can sort of get more tethered systems and not just a, uh, generic polymer cushion. Um, but roughly you're looking probably, I'd say around 10 to 20 nanometers maximum limit um, with this sort of system. Um, okay, so we have, I guess we have time for maybe uh, one or two more questions. So Christy uh, asks, have you got a chance to do the similar cell-free protein synthesis into cell-sized giant liposomes? Sure, uh, we haven't done anything that large. We're using 100 nanometer vesicles just because um, that's sort of the range you need to use to form supportive bilayers. Once you get above, I think about 400 nanometers, they won't spontaneously rupture on their own. Um, in this system, once the vesicles interact with the hydrophilic uh, glass substrate, they'll just kind of burst into the uh, supportive bilayer. Once you get to a certain size, they won't rupture. 
Um, so no, we haven't, we haven't looked at the cells at or uh, vesicles at large. I think we'll have time for one more, one last question. So Hussein, Mugimi and Naval, uh, thank, thanks for your great talk. What do you think is the surface density of incorporated proteins in your bilayer? The large increase in membrane resistance after your protein incorporation suggested a dramatic change in membrane properties. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question too. Um, we don't actually fully understand. So when I show the mobility here, we're actually limiting the protein expression a little bit so we can see, see single molecules. If you let this run longer, you'll see the entire surface covered. Um, so we actually don't have a good number coming out of what the actual density is. Uh, I imagine it is pretty high, but this is because we can sort of tune the reaction time in the cell-free environment, you can sort of select what you want to use. Um, so in this case, the density is low, so we can see single molecule tracking. Um, with, like you said, with the activity readout, we did have a large increase, so we might have more there. Um, one thing that would be interesting to do is couple this with the um, QCMD data. And that would sort of give us a bit of readout of maybe we can actually measure the mass of the protein. But yeah, really interesting question. Okay, well, with that, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Manza. That was great. And uh, we look forward, yeah, thank you to both of our speakers. And we look forward to seeing you next week.